If you laugh, you think, and you cry, that's a full day. That's a heck of a day. We'll have to tell yeah. you which songs are inspired by your wine, like which songs were written while indulging. Oh, I, I don't think I'll ever forget, David, you saying, be your best champion. All right, let's have some fun. Yeah. To next year. <laughs> <laughs> This beautiful Wagyu short rib. We're gonna just coat it in the Yemenite spice. I'm like, it's it's Saint Steel. Saint Steel's coming, and he's like, if it's Saint Steel, just ride it for free. I'm like, <laughs> join us as we savor world class wine, experience culinary adventures, and discover inspiring stories from our dedicated community of vintners, chefs, artisans, and beyond as we go behind the V. Hello everyone, I'm AJ Harris and welcome to Behind the V. Tonight we'd like to introduce you to our Virginia-based signature event, the V Foundation Virginia Vine Auction Gala. Join me and my honorary co-host, Mr. Pat Hogan, former Executive Vice President for UVA and Virginia Vine Committee member, as we go behind the scenes and share highlights from this exclusive UVA-themed meet and greet event with NBA Hall of Fame legend, Ralph Sampson. We will enjoy illuminating Q&A, intriguing basketball commentary, and incredible wines from Virginia's own award-winning Early Mountain Vineyards. So, grab a glass, sit back, and enjoy the journey as we go Behind the V. Um, we pulled this event together for several reasons. One, um, you know, the, we wanted to kind of get more people aware of the V Foundation, the Virginia Vine. I'll talk about that for a minute. And also just a chance to come together. And many of you I haven't seen in a long time, so it's it's great great being able to see you and, and, and be on this event with you. Um, the V Foundation for Cancer Research, I want to just take a couple minutes and tell you a little bit about that. It was founded in 1993 by ESPN and the late Jim Volvano, who I think many of you know was the head basketball coach for NC State uh, back in the... Uh, 80s and he won a national championship and uh, was quite well known as being a fabulous basketball coach and also an ESPN commentator. Um, he died from cancer and uh, in 1993 this, uh, this foundation was set up, the V Foundation. 100% um, of all donations to the V Foundation go directly to cancer research. Administrative costs are covered by a endowment that has been set up. So uh, when I say 100% of all donations go to cancer research, um, that is unusual, frankly, for a foundation. Um, all cancer types are funded for research. Uh, in Virginia, some of our three, our three mission partners, UVA, uh, VCU, and Inova, um, have received uh, almost annually um, or donations for research from the V Foundation. There's a grant application process you go through, and there's a scientific advisory committee that determines the award recipients. But just to give you an example, uh, UVA in just the past couple of years has received over $2 million in cancer funding from, from the V Foundation, cancer research funding. In total, more than $260 million in research grants have been awarded by the V Foundation. And the V Foundation is actually recognized nationally in the top 2% of all charities in terms of its performance and um, its uh, consistency in uh, providing uh, important uh, research funding. You, you'll, you'll hear me and others mention V Foundation and Virginia Vine together. The Virginia Vine is basically, um, if you will, the chapter of the uh, V Foundation. It's, a, it's an annual gala we have. Um, we've been doing this um, for, a number of years. We started in Charlottesville and actually when Terry Sullivan was president of UVA, that's how um, Terry and I got involved or UVA got involved um, as a mission partner was when President Sullivan was, um, uh, was you know, the president of the university. And um, we had an event uh, back, the initial event was back at uh, the, what's now known as Trump Vineyards. Um, and a couple years after we'd had the event there, we moved it up to uh, Loudoun uh, County to Middleburg, where the Salamander Resort has been the host um, resort uh, for, um, for the event each year. It's the last weekend of April. Um, this year, it's going to be um, uh, Danny and uh, 
Uh, Amanda, April 26th, that Saturday, is that the right date? It is the 24th. 24th, okay, that's yes, Saturday, Saturday, April 24th. 24th. Um, it's going to be a unique event this year. Um, we, we had to reimagine it, obviously going to be virtual. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but I want you to be aware of that. And, and a number of people on the call have, have been to this event in the past. And uh, so it's about a third of you have participated in this. So I know you're familiar with it. Um, this year, the fundraising focus for research will be on immunotherapy, um, which is a um, very important area of, for cancer research. It's all about, um, it's really great promise, but it's all about having the body fighting, you know, the cancer. And there's more research needed in terms of uh, which cancer patients would benefit the most from this type of research, how we can uh, keep the immune system from overreacting. And there are some cancers we learn, le need to learn more about that actually hide um, from the immune system. So it's an important area of research and that's gonna be the focus this year. Um, the program this year will be um, two parts is going to be on that Saturday afternoon. There'll be what we call a voices for, for victory. There will be a dynamic panel of um, funded researchers sharing their work. And that'll be followed by a conversation with sports legends um, detailing their connections to cancer. And then on Saturday evening, we will hold our annual auction gala, which is a live broadcast um, and where you'll be able to enjoy uh, virtually, and we'll, we're going to do the same thing we've done here for those of you who can attend um, and, 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 and can, um, can be there, uh, be with us virtually. There will be wine, auction packages, uh, and, and, and a virtual gala, if you will. But more information to come on that. What I'd like to do now, um, shifting, is um, Tony Bennett uh, couldn't be with us. As you might guess, he's uh, getting the team ready for Duke, but he did... Uh, Share, he did make a video he wanted to share with us in advance of the game. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this event to benefit Virginia Vine and the V Foundation for Cancer Research. I also want to say thanks to Pat Hogan for hosting this event and to Ralph Sampson. Ralph, I wish you could be with us as we're getting ready to tip, tip <laughs> off against Duke, but Ralph's going to be in attendance to have some Q&A and, and some commentary. Uh, there's no question all of us here have been affected uh, personally or loved ones uh, by cancer. And there's no greater thing we can do than come together and help raise support for research against cancer and one day finding a cure to it. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate your support. And um, hopefully I can raise a glass with you at some point and we'll be toasting a, a good victory, but we're grateful for everyone being here on such an important matter. And again, thanks to Ralph, thanks to Pat, and appreciate all of you guys. Go Hoos. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope everybody uh, was able to see that and hear it. Um, Tony and, uh, you know, coaches across, the basketball coaches, college basketball coaches across the country and, and ESPN have been important partners for the V Foundation. And this is not the first time that, you know, Tony's helped us with an event. I think it's time to enjoy our first wine tasting. And uh, Amanda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Pat. All right, so once again, just to kind of wrap a few things up that Pat was talking about, we will be talking about Virginia Vine and some of the details around that later on in the program as well. I definitely want to highlight some of the exciting things we're doing virtually for everyone. It definitely will not just be a normal Zoom call. I guarantee you that. So also on that note, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out and mention that I know we do have some representatives from both Ernst & Young and McGuire Woods here who are dedicated sponsors of our Virginia Vine event. Wanted to send a personal thank you from all of us at the V Foundation and the Virginia Vine Gala saying thank you for your support. We couldn't do this without you and we thank you for being here. Um, on to, I know we're all waiting for it, the wine. So I am so excited to introduce Miss Eileen Sevier to all of you from Early Mountain Vineyards. Um, Eileen, obviously you have been such an amazing supporter through Early Mountain of Virginia Vine for several years now. It's been such a great honor just get to know you and see all that Early Mountain is doing within Virginia. It is so exciting. Um, thank you for your continued partnership and for the partnership that's happening even now. And I'm looking forward to actually sharing the gift back offer that, that you're offering later on as well. 
Um, and I'll just hand it on over to you. What's the first wine that we're going to be trying today? Awesome. Well, thank you so much, AJ. And thank you, Pat, and all of you joining us. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be here representing Early Mountain. And I will say, first of all, I hope no one is waiting for me um, to start enjoying the wines. So please, I'm going to give a brief introduction to Early Mountain, um, but start enjoying the Chardonnay or the Cabernet Franc, um, the wines that Pat helped choose are really very versatile wines and two of our most popular. So I very much hope you enjoy them. But I am just gonna share some visuals as well to bring to life the beauty that surrounds us here in Charlottesville. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so as many of you know, Early Mountain is nestled in the Blue Ridge foothills. We're just about 30 minutes north of Charlottesville. Hopefully many of you have, have had a chance to visit us, but we've had a vision since our founding almost 10 years ago when Jean Case and her husband Steve purchased the property to really use Early Mountain to help put Virginia wine on the map. Um, as tech entrepreneurs, they're very ambitious and really believe that world-class wines that can be recognized around the globe are, are capable and, and are increasingly being made here. And so what V Foundation does with the Virginia Wine Program to really spotlight that work um, just really goes hand in hand with, with our mission at Early Mountain. And you know, with the, the dedication and the investment of, of Jean and Steve, you know, the, the recognition has been incredible. Um, already in 2016, just a few years after we opened, um, USA Today named us the number one tasting room in America um, in a reader's poll. So um, you know, so, so much incredible uh, work and hospitality has, has gone into what we're doing up, up at Early Mountain. So here's just a few visuals to bring to life the experience. Um, we are open, we are safely open following COVID protocols and really both spreading out through our beautiful property as well as hosting in our, our vaulted spacious tasting room and in front of roaring fires. Um, and where I think we are really unique is that we have a beautiful culinary program. Um, the team right now came from the Inn at Little Washington. And so not only is there amazing wine, um, but really a, a world-class dining program that is also focused on Virginia farms, Virginia products um, and local products. And that's why we, we really wanted to highlight um, local regional producers as well in the charcuterie board that, that we sent out to all of you. I'll share a little bit more about those farms when we get there. Um, so just to say a little bit about our, our winemaking, we bring a focus on mountainside vineyards. So really quality in Virginia comes down to, as it does everywhere where you're making top wines, um, to choosing the right sites. And for growing really top quality grapes in Virginia, for us, it's, it's mountainside sites that make the difference. Um, so a little bit about our, our two primary vineyards. And um, behind me, you'll see the Quaker Run Vineyard, um, which is our, our iconic mountainside vineyard site. Um, but we have two main properties that we're working with. One directly surrounds the winery, um, and the other is only about 10 miles away, but sits right on the side of a mountain, Quaker Run Vineyard. And with its elevation and rocky soils and constant airflow, um, is where we're able to craft some of the, the really top quality age-worthy reds, as well as some of the Chardonnay that's going into the first wine that we'll taste. Um, and so I was really trying to think of great sports analogies for you all. <laughs> and you know, one that definitely came to mind is, is work in the vineyard is, is very much like playing man-to-man -man defense. I mean, it's, it's really getting on every vine. It takes a lot of handwork. Um, the amount of man hours going through, you know, positioning the proper um, leaves and, and pulling and, and creating um, just that intense um, concentration and flavor um, really takes a, a very dedicated and team that's, that's really focused on each and every vine. Um, so moving to our winemaking, um, you'll hear a lot of winemakers say great wine all happens in the vineyard. And that's absolutely true. When we bring it to our winery, we're basically looking to be as low intervention and as natural in, in our production as possible. Um, so we use what's called ambient fermentations, letting the grapes own natural yeast, um, convert sugars into alcohol, 
Um, we use a very, really a focus on elegance and a light touch and things like the barrels that we're using. Um, and we're really letting the, the fruit and the work of those Virginia vines shine through. Um, so I mentioned the accolade about our hospitality and our tasting room. Um, in recent years, we've been acknowledged for our wine quality as well. Um, wine Enthusiast, one of the top wine publications, nominated us American Winery of the Year um, just a few years ago, um, followed up by Wine Business Monthly naming us a hot brand, you know, one of only 10 that they named throughout the country. Um, so we are the first Virginia winery um, to be acknowledged. So really feel that the hard work that, that Steve and Jean have tasked us to do is, is coming to fruition. So moving on to the wine itself. So we have two um, 2019 vintage wines. Um, so just to speak a little bit about the vintage, it was one of the, the best growing conditions we'd had in the last decade. Um, you know, it, it truly was a layup to make great wine um, in that vintage. And overall, Chardonnay very much represents our approach to winemaking. Um, because, you know, you can take, it's, it's a grape that's very malleable. You can make it in so many different ways. It can be very kind of full blown and, you know, intense and over the top, like a lot of California Chardonnays. It can be very elegant and restrained like French Chardonnays. And I feel like we really, um, much like we're geographically right in the middle, are, are really right between those two styles. Um, we're going for a lot of the, the fruit and expression of California with the elegance of France. And so with wine tasting, and I'll just lead you through the steps a bit. Um, first, you're really going to look at the wine itself. Um, and what you're looking for there, you know, with Chardonnay is it's this beautiful golden hue. I never spend too much time looking at it though. It's more about smelling and tasting. And when smelling, I always start first um, by just bringing the glass close to my nose and once you first start to smell it, is your sense of how aromatic this wine is. I always pay attention to how close the glass needs to get. And this is such a beautiful, expressive, aromatic Chardonnay with really, really pure, you know, lemon and stone fruit aromas. And then you swirl. And here you're really releasing these volatile components that contribute to much more intense. It's just an, an explosion of, of aromas. And here again, it's just ripe apple jumping out of the glass. Again, more of that stone fruit character. Um, but because of the ripeness of the vintage, even veering towards more tropical fruits like, like mango. And I was really thinking about this wine and some of the dried apricots on your charcuterie board as, as being a really nice echo of, of flavor and aroma. And then of course, tasting. And so um, what I love about our Chardonnay and about Ben and Meyer winemakers approach to winemaking on a whole is that there's just great textural balance. So there's right, you know, bright acidity. There's a lot of mouth filling creaminess, a really, really kind of clean lingering finish. And while we are working with barrel fermentation and aging, the barrels really are very much in the background. They're just, you know, a touch of seasoning. They're not the dominant character. Um, I included a picture here of one of our 500 liter barrels and spoke a little bit about our, our natural approach to winemaking. Um, this barrel is sitting out in the sun because um, the winemaking team needed to just warm it up a little bit. The fermentation was going a little slower. So they moved it outside to get some sunshine and warmth, um, which then got it jump started. Um, so I'm happy to take questions, thoughts, feedback. Um, I, I envisioned this wine going incredibly with both the kind of toasted pistachios, the dried apricots, as well as the, the richness and the creaminess, especially of the Blooming Breezes cheese, um, but would love to hear what, what you all think. That really was Excellent, Eileen, and I really do want to take a moment to offer an incredible congratulations with the awards that Early Mountain has obviously obtained in the past two years, or few years, right, is what you were saying with the wine enthusiast? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's that, that was at the end of 2019. So yeah, still pretty recent. Yeah. Kudos to you guys. That's fantastic. I did forget to mention at the beginning of this, if, if anybody does have questions for Eileen, you can always feel free to drop them in the chat as well. Yeah, Eileen also just want to say a huge thank you to Early Mountain, even more so that not only are they providing this amazing wine for us today, but they are also providing a 5% discount and 10% give back to the V Foundation on any sales of their wines from this event. So all you have to do is go to earlymountain.com, click on the buy wines and use the code V as in Valvano. V Foundation, V Wine, and you'll receive not only 5% discount, but also they'll be donating 10% back to the V Foundation. So that's a really special thank you um, to you, Eileen, for that as well. Let's see. Oh, that is a great question. So Glenn came on and asked, uh, love the Chardonnay. Can you only get it at the winery? Yeah, so it's, it's certainly available at the winery, certainly available in our online wine shop. Um, we also have a page on our website that's called Wine Finder. And so you can see there as well, the retail shops, um, the wine shops and restaurants where any of the wines in our portfolio that, that we sell through um, restaurants and, and wine shops are available. But Wonder. principally at, at the winery for, um, for both of these wines. And then Charlie also came in and asked, is it easier to make a great white or a great red wine in Virginia? <laughs> yeah, so overall, the challenges of, of growing great wine in Virginia, you know, just come down to the variability of climate. Um, and so to make a great wine overall in Virginia, it just takes this intense handwork, um, you know, very much, you know, as much as I said, it's it's man to man defense. I mean, it really is also playing offense and getting ahead of things, you know, really um, getting ahead with, with keeping your bunches all beautifully spaced and really managing what's called the canopy, the, um, you know, the green leaves that you can see behind me that are all like perfectly uniform, like soldiers. Um, all of that is to prevent any of the challenges of, of rain or humidity. Um, it's also finding a great site like our Quaker Run Vineyard, where there's constant airflow, where there's you know extra hours of sunlight because it has this beautiful exposition. There's rocky soils that allow the water to um, to drain more easily. Um, so red or white, it comes down to grape varieties too that are really suited for these soils in this climate. Um, and Chardonnay and Cabernet Franc are are two of those. They just happen to be number one and number two uh, most planted in Virginia. I noticed that as well. We tend to see a lot of those in all of the awards as well. Eileen, um, just uh, a quick question. All this unusually cold weather and snow, um, is that having a any sort of impact on Early Mountains vineyards that you're concerned about? Is this good? No, it's, it's actually fantastic. Um, Really, really cold weather would be problematic because it can kill the vines. Um, we never really get truly cold weather that would kill vines um, here in Virginia. Last season, so a year ago, it was quite mild. And so we had very early bud break. So vines go into dormancy during the winter. And then as they're waking up, you know, the first part of the season is, is bud break. And so as soon as you have that until usually about mid-May, Mother's Day, you're worried about frost risk that could then um, you know, kill the potential grapes for the season. So we had an incredibly long frost season um, in early 2020. And so what's great about this cold and the snow is that it's keeping the vines asleep. And so we're hopeful that we'll have bud break at a more appropriate time so that um, hopefully we, we won't have quite as many sleepless nights this spring. Yeah. So we'll I'm see. excited to say that coming up next, one of the great things about Behind the V and what you guys will be seeing here as well is really we want to get to the stories behind the people that support us. So obviously that also includes Eileen and Early Mountain. It includes our vintners. It includes our artisans. It includes our dedicated committee and also our sports celebrities. So we are so excited to have Ralph uh, together with us today. And Pat, I know that uh, you had mentioned that Terry Holland is also going to be on the call. So we're really excited to have Ralph score. Yeah, really so I know all of you know Coach Terry Holland and his wife, Ann, and uh, I'd like to welcome them. Um, mm -hmm. We are uh, 
delighted to have them join. And um, Anne and uh, Terry, I, I can see you both look great and uh, glad to have you with us on this event. Um, you know, Thank we've you. got a big, yeah. Yeah. go ahead, Anne. Thank you for inviting us. This is when I heard Ralph was going to be on a wine tasting, I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can see, Ralph has not left the lawn yet. So, uh, well, he should the, still be on the lawn. It could, it's probably not the first drink he's had on the lawn, but uh, <laughs> I bet it is. I bet it is. He never drank. <laughs> well, I never I did. No, I, well, I, I, only, only, only one night with Ricky Stokes and the M Society. So we had it on the lawn. That was a, <laughs> that was a bad night, and Coach Holland didn't know about that. Oh, Next okay. day practice, so it was good. Well, we can blame Ricky, can't we? There you go. <laughs> yeah, Rick is well, always good for to, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, we're going to get some insider. Well, sorry, Ralph and Pat, I'll let you take it away. And just an encouragement to everyone else, feel free to drop questions in the comments, and then we'll probably be calling on you here shortly to uh, come up and ask your own as well. So, okay. Ralph, um, first question I wanted to ask you, um, you know, this has been such an unusual basketball season. There's been some stops and starts for a number of teams. Uh, Virginia's had some of those issues. Um, you know, as you look right now, Duke, Kentucky, neither one of them are, are in the top uh, 25. And in fact, um, some would say they're on the bubble for even getting into the tournament. Um, it's just been such a crazy season. What, what are your thoughts on this? Um, from a former player perspective, how difficult this must be uh, for, for the players. And then, you know, uh, Coach Holland, it's got to be tough on the coaches as well. But, but Ralph, you want to maybe take, take a few minutes to reflect on that? Yeah, well, well, so, but first let me give honor and respect to Coach Holland and Miss Holland. Good to see you guys. Hope you all is well. Coach Holland, we love you. Miss Holland, we love you, the girls and all that kind of stuff. So, the best coach ever at UVA. I mean, Tony Bennett is amazing. They should give him a lifetime contract, but T. Holland right there is my guy. And Miss <laughs> Holland actually is my second mom, so FYI, so that's good. So hello, hello. Uh, hello. But it's, uh, and Miss Holland will con concur with this. So it's, it's great to see Duke, Carolina, Kentucky, you see all the big boys not being in the top 25. You know, the, from Dean Smith days to, to um, Koshevsky and all those days, whatever. I mean, it's an amazing year to see those schools not being in the top 25, but also it's a different year for everybody, I'm sure. But it's a tough season to w even watch. I think uh, we're getting used to watching no no, no, no fans in the stand, although it's, we would like to be there. But we're kind of getting used to that. And, you know, we have an amazing coach with Coach Bennett. Uh, I mean, I was there when he, when he won the national title, uh, the family structure, the – the, the emphasis he puts on defense and this family is really amazing. So we have the best coach in the country, and I think we should respect that. Uh, but guess what? We, we, we got the longest tenure of a national title, two years. So it, it will never be one quite like that again. So we, we, we got the reins right now. We'll, we'll have that forever. But it's got to be hard for a player to, you know, I, I feel sorry for the guys last year that were seniors and then get to play to kind of repeat uh, their their chance to get another title uh, to go to ACC tournament that's got to be hard. Seniors this year had to readjust. That's got to be hard as well. But I mean, as a player, you would be disciplined. I mean, I'm sure Coach Holland, if he was in this era of coaching, that he would make us very disciplined. We would follow the rules and we would play to our best ability that we could because we would not disrespect what the rules set up for. And I think that's what you see with uh, UVA and Coach Bennett as well. George Martin has a question uh, for you, uh, Ralph. He wants to know how far we can go in the NCAA tournament this year. What's your view of that? Well, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, kind of uh, the history has been uh, the UVA and the, the basketball team, they come on strong in the last, you know, month or two of the season. So I think you stand that as we go, although they had a little mishap with Florida State the other night, but the next the night they'll be really, really good. Um, but they get better and better as the year goes on. So I'm looking forward to kind of what's going to happen in the ACC tournament and to the March Madness. Uh, this year, there's no wild card team out there. I mean, obviously we played Gonzaga, Gonzaga early in the year, and I'm sure Tony would make adjustments going into if we have to play them again somewhere down the line. But I think we'll, I mean, we slated to be in the top 16. Um, and I think we'll do very well. And I think the team will be ready to play when the NCAA Madness comes. So, Amanda, I think we have another question. Uh, this is from Rebecca and Brad Lamb wanting to know, Ralph, uh, 
their son once uh, it was just telling them that you hold the record for blocks, um, you know, uh, around the rim. And uh, wondering if uh, you're all concerned about Jay Huff uh, coming close to your record. I would love for him to. I would love him to beat it, beat it if he can. That'd be on the ACC championship, blocking the last shot to uh, win win the game, to win the title, or going into the NCAA. So if he can get it, maybe we'll go for it. He's been there for a long time. But uh, Jay has uh, come on this year. Uh, everybody knows he can play, and he's gotten more aggressive over the year. I've got some time to spend with him uh, over the last number of years. But a great player. And if he can beat it, more power to him. You know, records are meant to be broken, and hopefully he can get that one. Oh, and then Tim Smith just came in asking Ralph, who would be tougher to play for, Coach Holland or Coach Bennett? Uh, well, Coach Holland made us get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and run miles over. I mean, it wasn't, we, we didn't have all the – we didn't have all the, the, the great stuff that guys have today. We didn't have training table in the, in, the, in the locker room. We didn't have the locker room that they have as well. We had lovely U Hall, which I would never trade University Hall ever. And, and you know, playing today, I would love to play in University Hall again. But when you got to get up in the morning and run three miles, and, and Coach Allen knows I hated to run distance. So <laughs> you got to imagine where University Hall was, right? And we would run where the baseball field is now, which was not out there with the track. We would run through the, the cross country trail. I would run out and they would leave me and then they coming back, I'm still going out. And I hated running uh, three miles every morning, but it made me a better player and a better person as well. So I think Coach Allen, I, you know, I don't know if Tony is his regiment his practices, but I only got one to mention. So Coach Allen's the best ever in my book. Yeah, it's amazing. The tournament's not that far away. I, I, I guess we are going to have an ACC tournament. There was some question early on about whether or not there'd be postseason uh, conference tournaments, um, but uh, it certainly looks like there will be. Well, you never know. I mean, it could change tomorrow. So we have to kind of just stay vigilant on what we're doing and see what happens. I mean, I can recall last year when, you know, we was out headed down to the ACC tournament and things happened. I was in Lynchburg, Virginia, going to Greensboro and, uh, uh, they say, oh, we're not having the tournament. Everything's shut down. So I'm like, okay, great. So we turn around and come back. But we'll see what happens this year. We Hopefully we can get it together and have a tournament. It's always good to have an ACC tournament. It's the best tournament in college basketball. But, uh, you know, you, you never know what happens. So, Ralph, before we go to our second wine tasting, I just want to make sure everybody knows you have made your home now in Charlottesville. You are a, uh, a, a native now um, in Charlottesville, right? Um, am I correct? You moved from West Coast back home? Yeah, you're correct. Right. So part of my, my journey has been, um, uh, you know, from, from in Harrisonburg back when my dad got cancer and uh, prostate and lung. We got him 100% healthy. He's 84 now, doing extremely well. Although he's really bored being at home. We got him locked down. He had his first shot already. He gets his next shot uh, vaccine next next Saturday. So I'm looking forward to that from California back to Harrisonburg. And then we were trying to do stuff on our family farm uh, this past year, but obviously they got halted as well. I was supposed to be on the farm living right now, which is kind of special to me and the family has been in our family for about a hundred years. And then some friends of mine that owned the San Diego Pride Race or a Virginia grad said, you know, you should move back to Shawville for reasons that uh, we can talk about later. So it all worked out. I'm living out by the airport and I'm loving being in Shawville. Well, we're loving having you here. Um, so we're going to come back to you later, but I think, Amanda, it's uh, time for maybe a second wine tasting. Indeed it is. My wine glass is almost empty, so I know I'm ready. <laughs> I hope you guys are too. <laughs> All right. So Eileen, I know that the next one that we have here is our 2019 uh, Shenandoah Valley Cabernet Franc. I'm very excited to try this wine. Can you kind of walk us through um, the lovely details and descriptions of this one? Absolutely. So just bringing back the visuals. Oh, sorry. So here we're heading up into the Shenandoah Mountains. And um, this wine is coming from two high altitude vineyards. And the word valley, when you're talking about Shenandoah Valley, is a little bit of a misnomer because it's actually um, a high elevation valley that's sitting between two ridge lines. So it's at about 1300 and 1500 feet above sea level. So similarly, we have rocky soils. We have a little bit of a cooler climate, um, a little bit less rain, and it's just the absolutely perfect place to grow Cabernet Franc, um, which is a grape that's, that's really coming into its own here in Virginia. So Cabernet Franc originates in France, but 
outside of the Loire Valley, it's used mostly as a blending grape um, in Bordeaux in various other places in, in France, as well as in California. And on the East Coast, and especially in Virginia, it's mostly used, it's, it's also part of blends, but it is mostly used in a monovarietal, um, single, you know, Cabernet Franc bottling. And what we love about it is that similar to Pinot Noir, it's a grape that really reflects sight. It's, it's very different, grown in different places. And so this, this Shenandoah Valley Cabernet Franc really reflects the high altitude, reflects those mountain breezes. It's this very ethereal, velvety, um, really red-fruited um, take on the grape. And so moving to tasting it, um, first of all, looking at the color, you'll see there's really, really nice density, really, really bright, um, almost kind of a purpley hue as, as it's getting to the rim, slightly magenta. And it's very aromatic. And what I love about this Cabernet Franc is it has from the vintage and the ripeness, kind of a, a darker black raspberry fruit um, with some of that more tart, tangy, red, red fruited character too. Dark cherry, wild cherry, as well as just a touch of tea leaf which is to me, to me is one of the distinctive characteristics of Cabernet Franc. It's just this slightly herbal note that can be kind of like sage or rosemary or, or kind of black tea. And then when you taste, I think here you'll get a sense of, of why I describe it as velvety. It's really mouth filling, it's really textural. Um, and there's a fair amount of uh, a word we use in wine tasting a lot, tannin, um, which is that kind of drying sensation that you'll get in a lot of red wines. And, and that's there, but it's this very, very fine grained velvety tannin. Um, so that combination of that kind of tart raspberry fruit, really, really fine grained tannin um, and just really bright layered character makes it wonderful for pairing with, with cheeses, with meats. It'll cut through the richness of, of your meat crafters salumi, um, but can also be enjoyed entirely on its own while watching a basketball game. Um, so very much crafted to be a wine for enjoyment with food um, or just entirely on its own. But would really love to hear your feedback on this wine. Oh, I think the velvety uh, texture is what really struck me and the, and, and the nose on this is fabulous. I don't think I've had this wine before. I've had the Chardonnay before, Eileen, but I don't, I don't believe I've had this one before. This is excellent. Um, there's so many Cab, Fran Cab Francs in uh, Virginia. I, I just, uh, this one to me is uh, really distinguishing. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Charlie Britt also came in and said, what is the highest rated best vintage um, for Cab Franc from Early Mountain? Um, so as far as the, the top vintages of the last several years, 2017 and 2019, both very much stand out. Um, they were both warm, they were qu quite dry. Um, in both, we were able to avoid any kind of, you know, fall hurricanes forcing us to pick early. Um, but we believe 2019 is just a notch above simply because we learned from 2017. And, um, it, you know, we're 10 years into this, so we're still very much gathering knowledge, gathering experience. And one of the most important decisions you make every year is when you pick your grapes, your harvest timing. And so we learned from some of the different picking decisions we made in 2017. We're able to apply that to 2019. And I think it really just takes the sophistication um, of the wines a, a notch up. Absolutely. Uh, and Charlie, of course, uh, responded back. So they need to buy all the 2019 vintage that they can find is essentially <laughs> what he's getting from that. <laughs> well, we'll be, we'll be releasing 2019s basically. Um, I mean, we've, we've released some, but all of the more kind of serious, most intense, most age worthy, um, we'll be releasing basically in the year ahead into um, next year, so. And on that note, Richard Shannon did come in and ask, how does the Cabernet Franc age? if you can give us a little intel into that. Yeah, so with wine aging, I always say to people, it depends on how you like to enjoy your wine. 
So this wine definitely has a lot of aging potential. What will happen as it's aging is that some of that primary fruit, the really kind of burst of, of raspberry flavor and cherry flavor will start to develop into kind of more savory um, notes. Some kind of mushroomy and more kind of dusty character starts to come out. Um, I love wines when they're getting to that, that stage because there's a lot of complexity and layers to them. Um, but that has to be what, what you're looking for in your wine. Um, so this is a wine, it will definitely hold and maintain this freshness, I would say at least three to five years. Um, and then we'll really continue developing. And I, I think with the density and the concentration of flavor, this could easily go probably eight to 10 years. With that, as we move into the second part, like I said, a lot of what happens with Behind the V is that we really want to get to the story behind the people that support us, specifically in our signature events. One of the things that I've discovered, I've been with the organization since 2012. So for quite some time, and it has been absolutely incredible to hear the amazing stories behind the people that actually support us. So that's been kind of my passion with Behind the V is bringing that to all of you and bringing that to the public in general. So with that being said, Ralph, focus back on you. I love your story. It is one of the most inspiring ones that I have heard, and I can't wait for everyone on this call to hear it. So um, can you tell us more about your story, why the V Foundation, your connection with cancer? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier. And really, what made you choose to partner with us? Because we're honored to have you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, man. So, so you know, this goes back to really almost 1979 when Derek Wittenberg and I played in the Capitol Classic. I'm sure Miss Holland and Coach Holland was probably around at that point in time as well. Um, so as you recall back then, there were the DC All-Stars against the National All-Stars. And I was part of the national team, but they recruited me because on the national team, they had like six or seven, seven footers, they had too many people. So I got recruited by the DC All-Stars to play on their team. So it was me, Derek Wittenberg, Sidney Lowe, Thera Bailey, uh, Quentin Daly, Mike Tissell, they went to Duke, a bunch of cast of characters that ended up winning against the powerful United States All-Stars. So it goes back to even then uh, when, when Coach Allen was recruiting me as well to do that. To, to From that point on, you have to understand, I've only had, I've had two significant losses. Of, uh, I mean, I, I think I may have lost 20 games and 20 some games in my Virginia UVA career. And two of them were very significant. I think now that I look back, uh, I don't like to lose. Obviously, I know Coach Allen doesn't either. Miss Allen hates to lose, so I get that as well. But um, – so one loss was against Chaminade. Everybody understand that. Gracefully, the Chaminade was at, at like 8 o'clock at night, so you guys were asleep back in, in, in that era. So you didn't really understand. You look at the paper like it's not real. But it created the Maui Classic that's still going on, so it created a great classic. So I'll take 50% of that and say that uh, we'll, we'll give them to create the Maui, Cla Maui Classic that's still going on as well. And, and then also, you have to remember, in 1983, we played against Derek Wittenberg, and Coach Allen, I'm sure, remembers this as well. We played Derek, and I tried to block his shot. He came down, twisted his ankle, and he, he had to sit out for a number of games. Uh, and he, he blamed me today for sitting that out. I, brought, I, I messed up his scoring uh, stats uh, for a number of years there. But if Derek Wittenberg didn't win against all the folks he won against in ACC tournament, including Michael Jordan, and all the other teams and us, he wouldn't have made it to the NCAA tournament. And then we get in, he beats us again, uh, and we had a last second shot to win the game. It was not there. He beats us, but he also then he wins against the mighty Akeem Olajuwon and the Houston uh, Cougar team as well, right? So if you all believe in fate, it, there was something there that the good Lord knew at that point in time that they was in the right place at the right time. Henceforth, the V Foundation uh, with Jimmy V. Now we appreciate Coach Valvano. Obviously, we didn't want to see him pass away, but it's it's a meaningful moment for me in my history of basketball at UVA and, and in my relationship with Darren Winberg that that was created from some of those events. He may have passed away then, but it's much more powerful to win a national title the way he did to make it now a worldwide foundation and organization as well from that perspective. And then henceforth, years later, um, I was living in Atlanta, I came back. My sister called me, which is, uh, we did a story on the V Foundation the other, actually yesterday. And um, 
My dad ended up with prostate cancer and lung cancer. Long story short, we got him fixed. And uh, I, I moved home, took care of him for a number of years, et cetera, et cetera. And he's 84 year old, 100% healthy. He's on no medications, no nothing. And the greatest thing about my partnership with the V Foundation was not only the relationship with the V Foundation, but the relationship with University of Virginia and the Emily Kirk Center. You know, Harrisonburg, Virginia had diagnosed my dad that it was kind of uh, bleak and it was done and they had to do operation right then. I came to Charlottesville, which I knew knew to get a second opinion, and, and Dr. Kozovar, which I still have his number on my phone. We talk every now and then. He checked on my father still today. He moved on from University of Virginia to, I think, St. Louis somewhere, but he went to work on him right away. And he said after a biopsy and all this other stuff that he did that we can fix that. And I believed in him. And the only way I believed in him, and I got really, I was clo I'm close to my family, but I was close to my dad because I would bring him from Harrisonburg to Charlottesville, which is an hour away, for all of his doctor's appointments, all of his treatments, all of his chemo. And out of all of his eight or nine weeks of chemo, he only had one bad day. And that's because of UVA and Emily Kirk Center and the nutritionists and the doctors there to help me get him healthy. Well, my dad took the biopsy of his, of his lung. And Dr. Kozlo, I said, well, we might hit your vocal cords. You might not be the same. My dad said, no, I sang in church all the time. <laughs> and so he, 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 he did the biopsy, put him on the hotel. And when I left the hospital, my dad would come out of the hospital singing the Lord's Prayer to the nurses. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, I knew what the deal was at that point, right? So we had a, we had a great bond. Like I said, he's 84. Uh, he's still strong and healthy. My mom's 82. So the relationship with the V Foundation just kept lining up from my history from Derek Wickberg to my dad to now. So I appreciate you guys supporting this uh, organization. You know, it's got to be a cure, cure out there for this stuff. And uh, hopefully we get one soon for all of it and help a lot of people out. So we then enforced and created the Samson Family Foundation. I re reinvented that where I ended up uh, raising about $325,000 for the city of Harrisonburg, Rockingham County Memorial Hospital. And the Emily Kirk Center, we did um, the Steve Harvey show where we beat Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the Family Feud and raised about $25, $30 for that, which we donated to University of Virginia Hospital as well. So I'm very passionate about it, and I look forward to doing more with you guys as well. And uh, let's keep it going. Absolutely. Yes. Yay, Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Ralph. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes that I hear, so one of the things, I'm not sure if everyone on all this call knows, but we do have one of the key things with uh, the V Foundation that is so precious, at least in my opinion as well, is we have a team of, I believe now it's grown to around anywhere between 20 and 30 doctors who are at the top of oncology of their field in the nation. And so that's our scientific advisory committee. And they are available. Uh, they all the grants, they're the ones that decide money's going to. One of the original um, board key, um, excuse me, leaders of the scientific advisory committee is Dr. Bast. And one of the things that he says often is it's not a matter of your cancer, it's a matter of when. And so that specifically to, um, to the V Foundation, that's one of the things that gives me hope. And so hearing that even from you, Ralph, it's the same concept. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so that's so important in all of this. So, um, so we had one question come in. Maybe we should just absolutely. ask Ralph, um, you know, real quickly. What was your favorite yeah. moment uh, in your time at UVA, either on or off the court? And if you're concerned that Coach Holland might hear something, you know, <laughs> some escapade off the court, uh, feel free to share that as well. <laughs> What happens at behind the V stays behind the V. Behind the V stays behind the V. <laughs> but I mean, you, you have to understand that, uh, it, 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 you know, it, it, obviously Coach Allen, Miss Allen. So Coach Allen would say, well, hit, Coach Allen's car knew his way to my house in Harrisonburg from day one, right? So a GPS wasn't even, didn't exist right then, but he knew how to get there. <laughs> uh, but and there's a lot of memories, a lot, a lot of special moments in my uh Played with the uh, University of Virginia coach Holland, Miss Holland as well. And I, I'll point out a couple. One was being recruited. And I had gone to Kentucky and North Carolina, Virginia Tech. And, and I've been to Virginia in the games many, many times. And I like, I don't need to go visit whatever, but Coach Holland and Coach Lopage and everybody, like, you got to come visit. And it was the weekend of my mother's birthday. So I, I come over and 
And I come to the University Hall, and there's a helicopter in the middle of the field that we're going to take a helicopter and ride over University Hall. Henceforth, I knew didn't know what was going on at that point. I like a helicopter. I don't want to ride a helicopter, but we did. And University Hall became Ralph's house, which uh, I didn't know at that point in time. But Tommy Hicks, after many years of trying to understand it, went up with his attorney and, and uh, painted Ralph's house on the top of the building. And henceforth, many years later, when uh, we imploded at University Hall, very, right, very right, so Roman, I, I, I would drive from Charlottesville to Harrisonburg every now and then, just go by and just look at it and see and, and reflect back on my memory at University Hall. And you have to understand, I was talking to somebody the other day. I said, okay, University Hall was a special place. Now athletes, football plays in their field. You never see the athletes anymore. Basketball plays in their field. You never see them anymore. There was no camaraderie with the players today that it was like when we played. And that's kind of funny in how it works today, whatever. But we were a unique family, not just basketball, but all sports. And Coach Holland was kind of the leader in that, I do believe. And Coach Betchwick and the football and everybody else that was there. And those relationships still last today, no matter who they are. Uh, I was talking to Jerry Capone and Barry Parker the other day, and that relationship lasts for a lifetime. And I think we don't we don't understand that today in today's world, but it, it is ever changing. But your your is a special place. Graduating and walking on the lawn was a special time. It rained, and then I had the opportunity to evaluate my career. Like I could have gone out and played. Just imagine. Coming out of University Hall, we went to NIT in my uh, freshman year against the mighty Kevin McHale and that crew as well. And I could have come out of school and uh, gone to the NBA, and, and Kevin McHale wouldn't have been a Boston Celtic. Uh, the next year, Isaiah Thomas wouldn't have been a Detroit Piston. And the next year after that, James Worthy wouldn't have been a Los Angeles Laker. But uh, we always go back to my mom and dad, which is my core values, and say, are we okay financially? My mom said, we work this long, we'll work forever. Don't make a difference what you do, we're fine. And then I will always say I'm on track to graduate. And then I have, you know, uh, uh, my education, which I did graduate, obviously. And then I had a great coach and a great teammates and a great school with a great education in ACC. So I had a win-win situation. So I stayed four years, obviously got my degree and then was no one picking in the draft anyway. So there's a lot of moments and memories, and whoever asked that question, you want to call me, I'll give you some dirty insights as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So, Ralph, Thank to bring you, it Ralph. back again, yeah, to bring it back, you know, talking about Virginia Vine and, and you know, one of the reasons why we're all here tonight, specifically what I've always been curious to ask you is what excites you about Virginia Vine and the V Foundation actually coming into Virginia and what that means? Because you know that for us around our signature events, it really is all about community. So I know for the V Foundation, we've absolutely loved coming into Virginia. We love being able to connect with everyone there. But from your standpoint, what are your thoughts as far as kind of your excitement around the V Foundation actually coming into Virginia surrounding the Virginia Vine Auction Gala? Well, again, it goes back to my upbringing with my mom and dad and Coach Holland, Miss Holland as well. I mean, when you're around good people all the time, you can understand. I mean, when I, I'm here in Charlottesville, when I wake up in the morning and I see the sun come up, I'm very motivated when my feet hit the ground. My sister, Valerie, and Miss Holland, Coach Holland knows her as well. She called me today and said, you got any turnovers today? And, and they know I, I don't like turnovers. I don't like to be – I mean, I, 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 you learn from mistakes as well. So what excites me about – um, the opportunity to be a part of this is just the motivation that I have with my own family and my upbringing, my coaches and, and everybody that I have around me that supports that. But also, what can I do to make a change? I don't, you know, I don't need to have my name on stuff and, you know, rah, rah, rah. I, I love the work. You know, I grew up in a, you know, in an area where my family had the farm, which is 100 years old, and a family that we're trying to repurpose now and do some special things with that. But, you know, if I can make a little bit of a change in somebody's life, for instance, in the Sampson Family Foundation, three components of what we do in Harrisonburg, Virginia, on the Ralph L. Sampson Senior Hope Fund is one, people don't have medication, don't have the money to, to, to get their medication. I think that's ludicrous in this country we live in, but that's, that's just the way it is. Two, they don't have transportation to and from the hospital to get their chemo treatments. And three, we help provide um, housing. So when my dad went through chemo for his radiation, we saw people that couldn't get to and from because you had to have a caregiver to, to bring them to the hospital. I think that's crazy as well. So we partnered with Uber over there. We partnered with the Madison Hotel so people would come could get their radiation, and then the money we raised went to their went to went to their medicine so they can get their treatment on time as well. And then the other part of that is, as you know, how powerful University of Virginia is. 
I took tours of to hospitals around the country. One is Hogue Hospital in California when I went was living out there. And I saw the disparity in the 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 ability to have a small hospital like Rockham Memorial to a Hogue or to a UVA. And we would go to get my dad's radiation treatments at Rockham Memorial. We would drive out there, it was like eight weeks every day of the week, and the, the equipment didn't work. Or they had to bring it in on a tractor trailer and have different equipment like well, you got a $5 million piece of equipment in the whole hospital, and, and I can take him over to UVA an hour away. We'll be in this little hospital, we can't get it to work. So that motivates me to do whatever I can to make sure people that have this disease get the best treatment that they can. So, it, you know, bar none, I mean, it shouldn't be a money issue, it shouldn't be a fundamental issue, it just should be a care issue. And uh, I think that we are missing the boat if we don't care for all the people that get this disease and understand why it comes and find a cure as well. Wow. Yes, that was incredibly moving. Um, thank you. And really, I know that I speak for a lot of us from the B Foundation when we say you were such a motivation, inspiration to all of us to, to keep going. So thank you for all that you're doing. I know your passion within Virginia and it shows. And we can't say enough how honored we are to even have you partner with us. So thank you. You're so welcome, man. Thank you. You, you, you work hard and uh, I our relationship has built over the years. So I appreciate everything you do. Again, I do want to, again, thank Eileen for being on with us. A huge applause to her and all the information. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you to Early Mountain. Um, I'm sure all of you guys have obviously seen from the package you received just how top notch this winery truly is. Uh, it is absolutely one of the best wineries that we've ever seen in, you know, in the vast amount of work that Max and I do visiting. And so it's just been such an honor, um, such an honor to have you here, Eileen. And thank you for the wines and for the amazing descriptions. It's definitely been one of the most um, entertaining tastings that I've been a part of. So thank you for that. Amanda, could you remind us the website that we can go to yep. to order some of the wine? Absolutely. So once again, Eileen has generously offered. So you will be receiving a 5% discount and a 10% give back. So 5% discount for, um, for you for going to earlymountain.com. And again, if you just click on buy wines, anything in there, if you utilize the code V wine, so V is in Valvano, once again, V wine, you'll receive a 5% discount. And then also on those sales, they will be giving 10% back to the Bee Foundation. So this is a great opportunity to purchase wine, to share with your friends. We can actually get even more revenue coming in for our Virginia Vine Gala and for the Bee Foundation. And you get to enjoy incredible wine at the same time. It's the best thing ever. So to give you a little bit of background or update on Virginia Vine. So like I said, it is not going to be one of your normal Zoom calls because that's the Bee Foundation. We always take things to another level. So I guarantee all of you, if you want to join us on the 24th, it's going to be fantastic. We have a great platform where everyone's going to be able to not only interact with one another at virtual tables, but then also on a whole watching a live stream. And so we have several different opportunities for that, uh, whether you're comfortable with coming and meeting in person or virtually, obviously this is all pending COVID and um, you know any restrictions we have at that time. So one of the key things for us too is obviously the safety of our, of our guests that come. That is a top priority for us. And so we'll be moving forward with looking at that as well. Uh, there will also be fabulous live auction items that will be available for bidding. We are opening up our live auction again this year. If you can't attend the event, you can still bid by proxy. Again, all this information can be found at that website. Clip. And so everybody, and remember, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Never give up. Don't give up. Don't ever give up.